All right. Welcome to the last part of the last session. Oh, I guess the first part of the last part of the last session of uh, Tony CS. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Arkadev Chattopadhyay at Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. Thanks. Thank you, Yeah, uh, It's uh, so nice to be here. Uh, well, I remember there was this workshop going on in the fields and uh, I won't name the persons, uh, some professor from McGill came up and said, so this is Tony Pitassi, your uh, postdoc mentor, and what, what's her age? And uh, I said, well, I, I guess it must be around 50. So that's like 10 years ago. And you know, he said, well, I must be lying. She just doesn't look uh, 50. <laughs> so anyway, it's nice to have uh, the 60th birthday celebration. So uh, it's a little change of plans. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sticking to the title, sorry for that. Uh, so this uh, talk uh, is uh, based on joint works with uh, a lot of people. Uh, Yogesh Dahiya, whose last name I've misspelled, so if he's watching, I'm really, I really apologize. Uh, Meena Mahajan, Yogesh is Meena's student at IMSC. Uh, Nikhil Mande, Jay Kumar, and uh, Swagato Sanya. So as uh, in many of my, or most of my work these days, the story begins with some paper of Tony, uh, which is always a starting point. So here as well, it is the case. So this is this paper that she has with Shafi Goldwasser, Russell, and Rahul. <clears throat> so this paper uh, is about uh, the pseudo-deterministic query model. And I'll tell you in a moment what it is. Uh, it's a very natural model for defining randomized, randomized algorithms in the context of uh, search problems. And uh, what these people do is uh, they prove a separation between randomized query and pseudo-deterministic query. In particular, uh, they show that there's a very natural search pro uh, problem, namely the random, uh, a random CNF formula, which is a TFNP search problem, which has randomized query complexity order one. That's sort of obvious, but the non-trivial, quite non-trivial part is that uh, the, the pseudo-deterministic query takes uh, omega root n many queries. So this gives an exponential separation uh, for the, uh, between randomized query and pseudo-deterministic query. <clears throat> so they asked two challenging questions and these were one, uh, the ones that really inspired Yogesh, uh, who was the one who got us all together. And these two questions were the following, improve this separation to uh, you know, a, a, an order one versus omega n, and I think this is still open. Probably Rahul is going to talk a bit about that after my talk. And the one that I was really interested in is to lift this separation in the context of communication complexity, uh, which is, um, you know, you same question. Now the model is two-party communication. Show a separation for a search problem uh, in TFNP, ideally, uh, which has order one or you know small polylog randomized uh, cost but every pseudo-deterministic communication protocol would require polynomial cost. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm lost at the very beginning already. So sure. what is a random CNA total function and e search problem for random? Oh, sorry, uh, so, so you, for every CNF, so if you take a random CNF, it's with high probability unsatisfiable. And so we look at this, the search problem corresponding to given an assignment, find a falsified Close. Okay, that's what I mean. Okay, so these were the challenging questions, and uh, you know, uh, Yogesh uh, and us, we thought a lot. So this was the early days. So it was just Yogesh, me, and Mina, and we couldn't, you know, do either of them. So. <clears throat> I had to uh, remind uh, Mina and Yogesh that you know, Tony loves to ask uh, really challenging and hard problems. So it's not going to be easy. <clears throat> and meanwhile, later on, Tony told me over Zoom that uh, I shouldn't feel so bad because she is still working on this problem and very actively and uh, you know, the problem hasn't yielded. So at this point, <clears throat> we said, let's change gears, let's make consider some intermediate uh, models. So I was mainly interested in uh, the communication complexity, as I said, since we couldn't prove anything there. Well, we, we said, let's look at 
some intermediate models, namely these things and or decision tree or parity decision tree. And let us see if we can prove similar separations like they have in these models. <clears throat> Sorry? Are you going to define pseudo determinism? Yes, I am going to define. Yeah. Uh, so, can you say whether the root n is the right one or not? What, what's the conjecture that uh, random formulas will give omega n? Okay. Yeah, I think that's the conjecture. Okay, so I'll start defining things a little bit more so that things become a little clearer. So, this is something I really don't have to def define, but uh, let's just slowly uh, go through this. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to now consider, although I will talk about search problems, this whole talk would be sort of converting a search problem into uh, a problem about Boolean functions and then doing things over there. So th these are some well-known Boolean functions or and parity and uh, indexing. <clears throat> here, the, this is an orbit indexing. And here are some decision trees, sort of canonical decision trees for these functions. And uh, what we would be interested here is, for example, if you look at the AND function, the depth is n. You can't do any better. If you want to compute the OR function, you require depth n. That's uh, simple to verify via an adversarial argument. But the size is n plus 1. And I will talk a lot about size. So size n plus 1 is sort of very economical here. So it's a very skinny uh, tree. The size for a height n tree could be two to the n, but instead it's just n plus one. Okay. <clears throat> so these are two measures, size and depth. Uh, size has received less attention. Depth has received somehow more attention. Uh, in the case of parity, this seems like really hard. You essentially have to do a full binary tree. So the depth would also be n as in the case of n, but now the size is two to the n. Okay. And here's indexing. Uh, where you have like uh, uh, R bits of addressing. So if you look at the, you know, uh, you, the first up to depth R, you're actually finding out what exactly is the addressing, uh, the set of R bits are pointing to, and then you read accordingly and output the bit, okay? So this would give you depth R plus one, size two to the R plus one. Now, if R is small, size is still small compared to N, okay? <clears throat> so I'll, I've defined now depth and size informally. I won't go into uh, more uh, formal definition. Okay, and uh, here's a question that uh, that's an interesting promise problem. Randomized, uh, we, we're looking at randomized decision tree for the following promise problem, where we want to find one. So you, you look at the string and you're promised that at least half of these bits are one uh, and you have to find a particular index which is set to one. Okay, so that's the find one function. And <clears throat> so it's quite easy to see that if you have access to randomness and all you are required to output is a valid index which has a one, then it's very simple. You just randomly sample an index, okay, an output if it has a one, otherwise you repeat it a few times. And if you were promised that there are at least half, half the bits are ones, within 10 tries or some, you know, you, you will be reasonably sure to find a one, okay? And you will give a, a valid answer. But there's a problem with this algorithm in the sense that it's not repetitive, right? Uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry, okay. Uh, uh, and the other thing to see is that, you know, if you were to do on the other hand, a deterministic algorithm, then it's easy to see that you will require omega n many queries because you could just keep answering zero until you have checked for half the bits, okay? So this is, e this is very easy, super easy for randomized, hard for deterministic. Uh, the problem with this randomized algorithm, on the other hand, is that with overwhelming probability, if you run this, yeah, you won't get the same answer, right? I mean, you will have the answers very uniformly distributed, your index, okay? And so what, what, is, uh, what, what is desirable, what would be nice is if you have a randomized algorithm, that has this access to randomness as before, but is able to give one fixed answer for with high probability for a fixed input. And this is what I would call is a pseudo deterministic algorithm. This was uh, defined first, uh, if I'm not wrong, by Gart and Goldwasser in 2011. And this is a beautiful concept which has got many applications recently. Uh, 
So this is what, uh, I, I'm, because I'm defining it in the context of uh, query algorithms, you could define in the context of uh, other algorithms as well. <clears throat> so for example, I think uh, Rahul and uh, Igor have a paper which shows that primes can be found pseudo deterministically uh, with sub exponential time between a number n and uh, it's uh, twice, but uh, we don't know of a deterministic algorithm. <clears throat> so this pseudo deterministic concept has, uh, is, is really nice because it asks for this non, non the non-repetitive behavior that you have for normal randomized algorithm, it tries to suppress that and wants something repetitive and still gives you the power of randomness, hopefully. So the question is, you know, for pseudo-deterministic algorithms, what's the, uh, what's the complexity for the same problem? And this is what the Gibbs paper proves is omega root n. Now let's look at, so, the, so the, the, as I said, the find one problem is not a total problem, it's a promised problem. The main uh, uh, building block of this paper was to look at the total uh, search problem, which was this random CNF formula phi that I uh, spoke about. Yeah, so you get a random formula phi with order one weight, and then you have the search version of this problem, search phi. <clears throat> So you have to output any one clause that's falsified by the assignment X. And the randomized algorithms is more or less the same. You sample a random clause and you output it if it's falsified. And you know these clauses, most of your clauses would be falsified. So the same algorithm works essentially. And the main workhorse of the GIPS uh, argument is to show that this particular search problem is uh, going to require omega root n cost in the pseudo deterministic uh, setting. <clears throat> okay, so how do they prove this? And the proof is surprisingly indirect. It uses a lot of machinery. In particular, it uses uh, Nullstellensatz degree lower bounds for refutations uh, of these formulas phi. And then it uses a very interesting new ingredient, the recent breakthrough result of uh, Huang on the sensitivity conjecture, which is now a Huang sensitivity theorem. So it's a pretty sophisticated argument, which sort of goes, uh, brings together a, a few things as is characteristic of many of Tony's work. And, <clears throat> and then it gets this uh, result omega root n. What we would like to do as they uh, pose is to, lift this to the communication setting. Yeah, so this now, when I have a superscript CC, I mean the analogous thing. So for in the communication setting, PD would mean pseudo deterministic. So same thing. So we, we, we would like to prove if possible that this is hard still the search problem, or at least if you lift the formula in a suitable way with a gadget like indexing, the uh, co corresponding search problem uh, is still hard for pseudo deterministic. Now this, in this workshop, it might seem that, well, why not use one of the lifting theorems that you have, right? The trouble is, you know, a pseudo deterministic solution of phi composed with indexing may not yield a solution for phi, yeah? And so, you know, uh, we don't know, uh, the, 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 the available lifting theorems don't work. <clears throat> It might not yield always the same solution. It might not always yield the same solution. So you can't extract solution for phi, uh, given a solution for, yeah. Okay, so that's the reason, as I said, uh, we looked at intermediate models or and, and, or and decision trees. So these are, you know, these are decision trees where just as in ordinary decision trees, uh, you query, but each query now it can use more, well, uh, exotic functions like or or and, yeah. uh, and uh, in one shot. So they're sort of touching, they have this uh, uh, flavor of communication because an or query is going to touch, it's not localized, it's going to touch all your input variables at one go, right? Much like what Alice would do when she communicates, she, comp she commun evaluates a certain function which is a function of all our input bits. So in the same way, an OR 
or an AND query would, uh, would, would, would touch all the bits and likewise parity. <clears throat> well, the first observation is that, well, if you allow OR queries, then even deterministically find one is easy because you could do a binary search, okay? And when, if you look at parity dec decision trees, then you can show that deterministically it's hard, but pseudo deterministically it's easy because you can implement an OR by using, rand uh, using, uh, using randomized decision trees. And now you can do the binary search to find the first one. And that'll give you a pseudo deterministic algorithm. <clears throat> it's also uh, interesting, the I'll have more to say towards the end, uh, you know, this is, really an interesting model because this is sort of the first model that where randomness and determinism are different. Just as in communication complexity, this is the, one of the most primitive models where randomness and determinism are different, even for computing Boolean functions. <clears throat> okay, so these two things show that not quite the same tools can work. Yeah, we have to, we have to find some analog of what uh, Tony and co-authors did uh, to, to, to adapt uh, in, in, the, in, the, in this context. We tried a lot, but it didn't work. We don't know how to, how to adapt that argument. As I said, there were many moving parts in that argument. <clears throat> so, you know, we decided to circumvent algebra. Okay. And well, this, if you look at, you know, when the function, when the range of a function is just two, then it's normal Boolean function. And then pseudo determinism exactly corresponds to randomness. And then there is this classic result of Noam Nissan from 89, which says that, well, randomness is not of much help. Right? So if you look at uh, decision trees, uh, ordinary decision trees, now I'm talking, then the deterministic decision tree complexity is always upper bounded by the cube of the randomized complexity. So, and if you dig more into the proof of this, then you see actually that you can adapt uh, Nissan's argument to multi-output functions as well. Yeah, there's nothing much going on about, uh, you know, this function being a Boolean function. It would just work for multiple output functions as well, the same relationship, okay? But if that works in the same way, then, you know, what does a, what does a pseudo deterministic solution do? A pseudo deterministic solution is offering a solution. So it's actually computing a multi output function as a randomized process with high probability, right? And if you just put these two arguments together, um, sorry, yeah, I mean, this, this observation, I, I forgot mentioning. So this is not completely novel to us, this observation that Nissan's argument continues to work in the context of multi output functions was sort of implicit with a slightly weaker ver version in, uh, I think this is uh, Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Ron. Yeah. They, they also observed this uh, uh, previously, uh, but it's a slightly uh, uh, weaker uh, version because they have a log dependency on the, on, on the range of the output. And we, we, we can get rid of that by just you know, being a little bit more careful. <clears throat> I don't know what multi output is. Do you mean larger range? Yes, larger range. Zero, one, two. Let's say in the search problem, zero, one, two, n, where n is the number of clauses. So this, uh, our observation is that this continues to work no matter what the range is. And now if you put these two ideas together, you can see that, you know, in fact, in the ordinary decision tree model, Pseudo determinism for search problems doesn't buy you much uh, when compared to deterministic algorithms. Okay, so you know the same relationship. You just replace the R by the pseudo deterministic here, in, 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 and and this goes through. And this would immediately give you an n to the one third lower bound on the search problem, because we know the search phi, where phi is a random formula, because we know that deterministically it's very hard omega n, and this would give us n to the one third. So that entire machinery, if we were willing to settle for n to the one third can be avoided by just making this connection, which is to say that pseudo determinism and determinism in the two models are the same uh, up to a polyfactor block. So 
forget. No, it's still not normal than the two is bad. Yeah. Two is the best lower bound, and uh, even here, it's not known where the three is yeah. This hasn't moved since Nissan's time. I think we expect it to be quadratic. I don't step. know what, uh, yeah, well, everybody would agree that we expect it to be quadratic. Not, not clear to me. <clears throat> Okay, so you know, having noticed this, this was encouraging, and then we thought, okay, maybe we can try to do the same thing for and or decision tree. Yeah. <clears throat> or, you know, this more exotic decision trees. Uh, so, can we de -random de randomize this, uh, this decision tree algorithms? Because just as we saw before, the starting point of those arguments was in the simple Boolean function case, and then we could use no omniscience argument. Now we're talking about this more exotic decision trees, which have these act, which give you access to and uh, queries or and or queries or this parity queries. Yeah, and the same. So the analogous question is pretty clear. Right, right. <laughs> You're paying attention. So you, it, it, it of course won't work for parity. This is false, right? But what about these two? And at this point, uh, an interesting thing happened, which is that we found out, Yogesh found out, that you know, there were four other people who had asked the same question as this one, uh, at least the first one, from a different uh, context. Uh, this is, if I'm not wrong, this is Alexander Nob, Shahar Lovett, McGuire, and Yuan. And they, their motivation was very different. They were trying to prove lifting theorems for uh, you know, when you lift with the AND gadget. Okay, So their motivation was communication complexity as well, but to prove lifting theorems. Another area where Tony has had a great influence. So both these works were influenced by Tony's work. <clears throat> but we sort of came to it from a slightly different point of view. And in fact, that maybe we were sort of, I mean, you know, they, they used more algebraic ideas and they were trying to solve this problem algebraically, whereas we are trying to use more combinatorial uh, methods. So <clears throat> the first observation we had was, you know, you could make it even simpler. You could ask the same question about ordinary decision. I mean, you can, you can reduce the question about and or query complexity to a question about ordinary decision trees. And as I said before, somehow depth is, has been more studied in decision tree and size less, but you just look at this simple connection. Uh, this shows that you know, the, the and or query complexity is sandwiched between log the size. Yeah. And this is not hard to see, this is obvious. And this one, you know, just look at the first uh, thing that I showed, you know, an and, uh, and, and or therefore as well, has a very skinny decision tree where the size is not large, okay? So just uh, these two uh, facts give you the, the very uh, nice thing that, you know, if you can sort of de-randomize size, you're done of ordinary decision trees. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the depth de-randomization. And then we thought that, well, I'm sure we, are, we were thinking that, you know, Noam or somebody else must have uh, looked up at decision tree size. And it was very surprising that this question was never asked. This was talked about in the literature in, uh, in, in, in sort of implicit fashion, um, saying that there could be some size savings, but nobody asked this question, can, can it be de-randomized? Okay, so this was an unaddressed question. <clears throat> and uh, in another work at this point, what happened was my student Nikhil Mande uh, was working on some other problems and he came up and asked a question and it turned out that his question and this question were very closely connected. He was working with ranks of decision trees, something to do with learning theory. And you can again look at ranks essentially as a question about size. So every question, the two questions sort of converged on understanding the role of randomness with respect to size. Okay. So, 
Okay, so let's look at Nissan's classic argument. Okay, uh, uh, just uh, a little bit. So <clears throat> Nissan in particular showed the following thing, right? Which is a beautiful ca combinatorial characterization of query complexity. He showed that the block sensitivity is the right combinatorial quantity to look at because deterministic randomized, they're all sandwiched between these things, right? And this was very influential, as you know, block sensitivity, the, the, the most important contribution I feel of the work was to introduce this concept of block sensitivity. Okay, and this is a very, this has been a very influential notion, but for our problem, block sensitivity just doesn't work because if you look at the AND function or the OR function, the block sensitivity is N because if you look at OR at the all zero input, every input is sensi completely sensitive. And so this, I mean, even though these functions have very large blocks and as large as it gets, their sizes are very small, right? So you can have functions with very large blocks and sensitivity, but still small size, right? So this, as it is, block sensitivity is, uh, is not going to work. <clears throat> so what we do, or we thought at that moment, at that point was, well, let's look at, an, after you know, trying it out various things, we thought that this is an interesting new notion. Let's look at sort of the counting analog of block sensitivity, which is uh, what we call the block number of a function, which is the number of minimal sensitive blocks of a function at point X is its you know, sharp BS. Okay, and then just as in the case of Nissan, we will maximize it over all X and that'll give you, uh, yes. Here, the difference is these minimal sensitive blocks don't have to be destroyed. Yes, they don't have to. You, you go through all, all of them. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. And this will become clear here uh, yeah, because, you know, uh, so let's, let's see some examples. So for OR, it's always at most N, just the same as block sensitivity. Same for N, but if you look at the majority now, it is very large because if you look at majority at the all zero input, there are many overlapping sensitive blocks. In particular, there are exactly n choose n over two minimally sensitive blocks, right? So this could be exponentially large. Okay. And uh, well, it turns out later we learned that this was not a completely new notion. Uh, Avishay Tal and Kulkarni in 2016 had used the same notion, they called it by a different name, but in a different context. Okay, so uh, to summarize, what we found out was this is very helpful to look at the block, uh, uh, the block number uh, with uh, Yogesh, Nikhil, Jay Kumar, and Swagato. What we were able to prove is this is very reminiscent of Nissan's bound. We get log the randomized size is at least log the, if there was no log n, this would be exactly the analog of Nissan but we get an extra log n. And if you want to talk about it, we can talk offline, this log n cannot be avoided. <clears throat> uh, and then on the upper bound side as well, we can, we do not get again as clean a result as Nissan got it because you, know, you involve this combinatorial quantity, but you also involve randomized size. Again, uh, you cannot avoid this uh, because if you, I, I can say that offline, I'm consuming time. Uh, but you can, because of this being lower bounded by that, you can patch it up nicely. So here I'm, I'm using the fact that R size is lower bounded by log the counting number. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so. There's D size in the middle. Yes, there is D size in the middle. Oh, oh yeah, 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 you should read it. This is like a chain. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this worked out. And then by the previous observation, you could use similar ideas that we had uh, before to say that now we can work on, on search problems as well. Okay, and so we can show that, you know, the same thing, this is uh, jointly with Nina and Yogesh, that for every total search problem, now the uh, size, when you're dealing with size, it doesn't matter. 
the you know uh, deterministic size log of deterministic size and log of pseudo deterministic size for total search problems are polynomially related up to this log n loss up to some polylog factors <clears throat> and this i think gives a one interesting immediate consequence of this is the following which i think uh, was not known uh, is the following if you have a random cnf order with order one width formula and you look at its search problem then you can this just shows that the pseudo deterministic size of the search file problem is going to be exponentially large i think in the gyps paper what they showed was that if this was to be lifted by xor then this would be large but the unlifted formula as far as i know it was not known so uh, is that right <clears throat> and this we get for free because you know uh, we know that the deterministic size is large so pseudo deterministic has to be large because pseudo deterministic and deterministic are polynomially related and uh, uh, you know you can now as i said you can just uh, because you've got a bound on size you can use it to bound all these exotic models and uh, well, this one I'm lying a bit. This requires a bit of more work uh, uh, because you know uh, the short answer is because and decision trees cannot balance themselves. If you were asking monotone and queries, they cannot balance themselves. Whereas or and decision trees can balance themselves. So you get if you get an ordinary decision tree size lower bound, it immediately yields a lower bound for this for for and or decision trees. But for just and decision trees, you have to work a bit more because they don't balance so it's not clear how to get it how to go from size directly okay but this can be done and now once you do that and you use our trick uh, from before you can also say the same thing for search problems if you have paid attention carefully you know this exponent keeps going up in the search problems and that's because to absorb the range <clears throat> so uh, and because now we get this, now we can separate. Our random formulas would be a separation between randomized and pseudo -observed. Okay, so this gives us the separation for intermediate models of and or decision trees. <clears throat> and there are many open problems to work. Uh, some of the open problems, my favorite one is parity decision trees, because this is the first model, as I said, where randomness and determinism are different. The easiest model, yeah. Yet it seems very hard. I mean, maybe we are being dumb, but seems uh, we have no idea. Well, communication complexity seems a little farther out even because if we can't show it for parity decision trees, then it seems uh, communication complexity is more. And uh, there are many other problems uh, uh, I can talk about if you're interested uh, to offline us. <clears throat> okay, uh, to conclude, <clears throat> You know, Tony gave me lots of good advice from 2009 to 2012 when I was a postdoc. I had a really great time there. Uh, she told me several times at that point to learn Raz McKenzie. I kept on ignoring that. She asked me to learn proof complexity. I never learned it, but now I'm all of a sudden very interested because of this search version of it. I wish I paid heed to her advice. Well, I was interested in my own problems, mostly with meta problems. So therefore we ended up writing a paper titled, a little advice can be very helpful with uh, Jeff and Faith. And it was lots of fun. Happy birthday to me. Thank you, Arkadev. Any uh, questions? Yeah, can you say, say some of the things about uh, DAG size? Uh, the OR, or and DAG size, that would be interesting. That, I, that, that thought came to me when I was preparing my slides. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> be interesting. Yeah, so uh, your simulation is, is a, for size is like a quasi polynomial simulation, right? Is there any hope of getting a polynomial? Oh, you mean because of the log? Yeah. Uh, 
I think there is, there is a counter example. Uh, the top of my head, I, I, I'm not able to recall, but I don't think you can do that. But this is the best one can hope for. Yeah. What, what about shaving off the log n factor? Oh, you said the log n factor in the lower bound was tight. But what about the upper bound? Because you like a log cubed n. Yeah. Uh, no, no. So the log cube n in the upper bound. This one, right? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, any one of them. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Well, this log cube n appears because of the, I mean, one of the, okay, you might be able to reduce this exponent uh, to log of n, but I, I don't think you can reduce it. I mean, you can get rid of that. Uh, this is not possible. Uh, for example, look at the threshold two function. We can talk offline, yeah, but the sure. threshold two function, you know, it requires deterministic communication, deterministic query complexity log of n and randomized uh, one. Oh, I see, I see. Order I see. one. I see, yeah, yeah, sure, okay. Uh, more questions? All right, yeah. Uh, <coughs> do, you, do you have uh, some examples of uh, non-trivial uh, upper bounds for some the deterministic uh, question marks? I think there's a quantum up the bound. But for parity decision trees, if you consider that to be non-trivial, non yeah. Otherwise, no. Uh, more questions? All right. Let's thank Arkadev again. Thank you.